uh, shake everybody's hands as we get started into our service and let everybody know that we are so grateful that they have chosen to be here. Raise, did I say raise? And you greet those around you, join with us as we sing. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. everyone this morning I uh, got quite a few announcements some different dates we'll uh, make sure we get this pinned up on the bulletin board but if you got an ink pen or whatever want to write down some of these dates some of these are ones we mentioned before and got some new ones on here a lot getting ready to happen here at the church so uh, uh, sister Laura wanted me to remind everyone that or tell everyone there will be no kids classes tonight so uh, no kids classes tonight. Wednesday night, we're going to finish painting the rocks. And as we mentioned last week, next Sunday, the kids are going to go around town and wear their T-shirts, and they're going to plant these rocks uh, around the town. And that will take place from 6 to 7 next Sunday evening. So, But there's no kids classes tonight, so just a reminder on that. Also, not this coming Wednesday, but the following one, Wednesday, July 12th, is our monthly business meeting at 6.30 p.m. There will be meal that night, and once again, just a reminder, our meals are now starting at 6 instead of 5. Classes are still taking place at 6.30, and would welcome you to come. If you've not been coming, the classes are really good. The men's class and a women's class taught by Pastor Mark and his wife, Christy, they're really good. If you would like to be a part of that, getting ready to start in the men's class, the seven I am statements of Jesus. Uh, so anyway, that's going to be really good if you can come and be a part of that. Also, just a reminder, the men's breakfast, July 15th, that third Saturday of each month, that'd be from 7 to 8.30. Uh, Mitchell and Rihanna are gone today, but just a reminder, VBS is quickly approaching. If you have any questions about that, when they get back, you can ask. But the kickoff is going to be out the pavilion July 22nd at 6 o'clock. And then VBS will be Sunday through Thursday here at the church, the 23rd through the 27th. So that's rapidly approaching also. We're in the month of July now, so it's coming up quick. Also, the ladies wanted to let everyone know, you write this date down. After the morning services on July 30th, so four weeks from today, there's going to be a luncheon here at the church immediately following the morning services. So if you can, make plans to stay for that, just a church-wide luncheon for everyone. And also, a couple other things that we've got coming up here. 
uh, many things, like I said, going on in the church. Uh, we've got a committee together that's starting the process of trying to find a youth director for our church. But with all the stuff that's coming on, with VBS getting ready to happen, school getting ready to start back before we know it, we're going to have, we've done this in the past, and we're going to do it again. We're going to have a 24 hours of prayer here at the church. Uh, there will be a sign-up sheet. Uh, Kendall has got one made. I don't know. She's not in here right now. I don't know if she has it pinned up yet. But what we're asking uh, individuals, uh, Sunday school classes, families, uh, however, this is going to start on Friday evening, July 14th at 6 p.m. It will be here in the auditorium. We will have it set up up front here. Uh, we will have like a dry erase board in here where you can write prayer requests on it or sticky notes where you can write prayer requests on it. We're asking individuals or Sunday school class to each take an hour from like 6 to 7 p.m. Friday night, 7 to 8 p.m. Friday night, all the way through. And this will conclude uh, from at uh, 6 p.m., from 5 to 6 p.m. on Saturday evening with an hour of prayer and worship corporately as a church family together. We've done this in the past, and uh, uh, honestly, it's been a real blessing. So we're hoping that you can sign up for one of the blocks, one of the hours, and we'll come up here, and you may think, well, I can't pray for an hour, or, but uh, there will be Bibles in here if you want to sit and study when you're done praying, but we just ask that you come for that hour and that our hearts be right and take that hour. But that's going to start on Friday evening, July 14th, at 6 and then filter over into in from 5 to 6 p.m. on Saturday, July 15th. And that 5 to 6 p.m. July 15th, that Saturday, will be for our entire church family to come together. And so, man, the, prayer, or the men's breakfast is that morning. So, guys, don't sign up at 7 or 8 o'clock Saturday morning because you'll miss the breakfast if you do. So I uh, have to have some women sign up for the, <laughs> those hours. But uh, anyway, a lot going on here at the church. Uh, and also coming soon, more details are going to be coming soon, but after Bible school is over out at the pavilion, we're going to have what is called a back to school bash. We got more details coming about that. Hopefully we're trying to work it out where the band that Kinley's in, they're going to be playing out there that night. Uh, may have some stuff set up, bounce houses and stuff for the kids, but it's not a church-wide, it's a community-wide. Asking for the entire community with kids, grandkids to come out there that night. And we're going to have food and different types of games and just basically to kick off the new school year uh, that's going to start there's still some planning that's got to be done for this but that's more than likely going to be was that August 5th I can't remember S somewhere that first weekend in August so anyway keep that in mind a lot of dates coming up here but anyway a lot of stuff going on we'll put these announcements out on the bulletin board Kendall normally does if you can't remember a date or if you want to get with me afterwards, a lot going on in our church family right now. So any other announcements that need to be made before we go to the Lord in a word of prayer and have our ushers come forward? Okay, if our ushers would come forward, and Pastor Mark, take up our morning offering. Uh, I tell you what, God is definitely on the move, and he's got a lot of things planned for us as a church family uh, and as a, as a community. And as you heard just the sampling of it, there's a lot of excitement going around. Uh, so please make sure that you invite, invite, invite uh, anybody and everybody that you can to come join us at these various events. Uh, let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the way that you are moving in our community. We thank you for uh, allowing us to be your vessels out into this world. Uh, God, we know that there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of struggling, but there's also a lot of love and grace, and that love and grace comes from you, and we are so grateful that we get to be a part of this, that we get to be a part of your kingdom, and God, we just pray that you speak to us this morning through message and through song, that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us, and help us to know that you are indeed always with us, and you are always sovereign. And God, as we come before you this morning, bring our gifts of tithes and offering, I just pray that you, you take those, you bless those, and you use those to further your kingdom, your ministry into this world. God, we are merely your vessels. We, our job is to take out the gospel message into this world and uh, always pointing glory back to you where it belongs. And God, we are, we are grateful we get a chance to do that. And we just pray that the, these particular gifts help that ministry to grow. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. of Jesus, his mother and others, beneath the cross of Jesus.
Psalm 33, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. As we come, as we're in this 4th of July weekend, may we pray for our nation. May we never take for granted what we have and what God has done for us. Each of these verses we know them well. America, God shed his grace on thee. May God mend thine every flaw. May God thy gold refine. May God shed his grace on thee. Join us as we sing America the Beautiful. <laughs> studied on what to sing all week and uh, I had another song that I really wanted to sing but God changed that this morning. Um, a few years ago 
several of us were heartbroken by things that happened at our church, as most of you all know. Um, and you welcomed us with open arms. And when we came, we knew we were loved. We knew you cared about us. And we're family now. And I'm just so grateful for that. And so that's why this song. Grab your Bibles and turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. 
we were going through this series called Transformed, which is a, a closer look at the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. A sermon that was preached on a mountainside 2,000 years ago by Jesus himself. A sermon that at its very core describes what the kingdom of God looks like. It describes how we are to live our lives. It describes what our lives should contain if we truly have a relationship with God. It's a sermon that has been very intriguing, very exciting, and very confusing to a lot of people for a lot of years. It's a sermon that has been misquoted several times. It's a sermon in which people have taken bits and pieces and twisted it. And what we're doing in this sermon series is we're taking a closer look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and trying a little bit more to understand what it is that he's communicating to us. And one of the things that is being communicated in here is about how to have true and loving relationships, not only with God, but with each other. That word relationship is an interesting word. When you look it up in the dictionary, what you get is a, connect, a close connection with someone or something to a point where there is a strong form, a bond that forms between the two of them. You see, that's what Christianity is all about. It's about a relationship with a loving and wonderful and gracious and merciful God. It's about a relationship with his children, pouring into each other, loving on each other, strengthening each other, growing together in what God has called us to be, what God is calling us to do in this world. And this morning, in our section of passage, what we're going to do is we're going to take a closer look at one particular relationship that exists. And that's Jesus and the law. A lot of confusion happens on Jesus saying that he came to fulfill the law. Or did he really come to, to wipe away with it? Does the Old Testament Mosaic law no longer exist? Does it still exist? Do we still fall under it? We're supposed to do all these lists of rules and all this stuff. Or is Jesus truly the fulfillment of what took place? And what we're going to do is first look at the intent of the law why it was given, why God gave us the Mosaic Law, and then look at the relationship that's connected between Christ and that law. See, when God gave the children of Israel the Mosaic Law, it had its purpose. There was a reason behind it, and it was in order to help them identify right and wrong, to help teach them about holiness, to learn that God had a solution for the sin problem, that's running rampant in their lives and to understand that the forgiveness that they needed is not going to be easy because it is going to require a very special sacrifice through the shedding of blood. There's something big that has to happen in order for the forgiveness. But we have to learn this. We have to learn the process. And the Apostle Paul talks about this particular concept in his letter to the people of Galatia when he explains that the law was given both as an instruction tool and pointing out our need for a savior. In Galatians, it says the law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Some translations will say instead of guardian, it'll say tutor. And what that means is a way to help us to understand certain concepts. For example, one of the things that we needed to understand about sacrifices is the importance of the blood shedding and covering over our sins. But it doesn't work for a personal standpoint. That's why we have to have Christ who comes and pays the ultimate sacrifice, and we'll learn that as we go on. But we had to learn what a sacrifice was. We had to learn what actions were required from us. We had to learn about our in personal sacrifices and then the sacrifice of the blood being shed. It was a tutor, it was a guardian, it was something to help us understand what the kingdom looks like. And in our main passage, we're going to see two main themes taking place, two main things. First, we're seeing how Jesus doesn't just fulfill the law, but rather he is the fulfillment of the law. And second, Jesus is going to be pointing out the relationship that we have with the law as his disciples. And let's look, so let's read in our passage this morning in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but fulfill. 
For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Those are some pretty heavy-duty words. And in many ways, they can be confusing. And my hope is that as we unpack this text this morning, that we might gain just a little bit more of an understanding of the relationship that exists between Jesus and the law. And the first thing we're going to look at is the importance of the law. The importance of the law. Notice that our text starts out with Jesus explaining that he did not come to abolish the law. This is an intentional statement given in order to help the people understand that the Mosaic law had its place, had its purpose. And he is coming not to put an end to that, but rather to enhance the meaning, to fulfill it and to take it to the next level. You see, the law was necessary in order for us to receive the righteousness of God. But since the only one who could ever meet God's standard is God, God had to come to embody everything that the law contains. And that somebody is Christ. He comes in the form of Christ to fulfill that. In John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. While Jesus is up on the cross, he proclaims the words, It is finished. But what was finished? What is it that has come to completion? What is Jesus talking about in these moments? For that, we need to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Because there's something we see there to answer this one question. It says, therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, you did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, God. After he says above, you did not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He then says, see, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. What was finished? It was the sacrifice of the forgiveness of all sins. When we place our faith in Christ and in Christ alone, his perfection, his righteousness becomes ours. Christ took on the sin of the world, the wrath of God, paid our debt in order to extend to us his righteousness, to make us one with God, to connect us back with him for all of eternity. The law taught us what we needed to do and what we needed to know. Jesus fulfilled that aspect coming through. If you look at the very first book of all the Bible, of all scripture, the book of Genesis over in chapter 22, there's a story in which God calls Abraham to take his son Isaac to a land that he will show him and to prepare a sacrifice there. This was a picture of things to come. And when Abraham gets where he is supposed to go with Isaac, fully prepared to sacrifice his son, fully prepared to do the actions that God has called him to do, God stops him and prepares, presents a lamb. Why? Because Isaac was never meant to die on that mountain. That son was never supposed to die, but there was a son that would die. It was a prophecy of what was to come. God would send his only son to be the sacrifice for sins. God would send his son to be the sacrificial lamb, to have his blood shed upon the altar. There would be a son that would die for the redemption of all mankind. See, Jesus is saying there is an importance to the law. You had to understand this concept in order to receive. You had to understand the importance of what a sacrifice was. You had to understand how to live a certain life. You had to understand what true love looked like. You had to understand what relationships look like in order to be able to receive those things from God, in order to be able to see, receive from Christ what he has done for us. The second thing we're going to look at is Jesus fulfills the law and the prophecies. 
Jesus fulfills the law and the prophecies. The Old Testament Mosaic law was broken down into basically three categories. Those governing the actions and behavior of the nation of Israel, governing the means by which God was to be worshipped and how man was to be made right before him, and governing principles in which God wanted all men to live by in a relationship to himself and with each other. And when Jesus comes, he fulfills all three of those categories. He shows us what all three of them truly mean and how to live it out in a relationship with God and with us. He explained it wasn't just about the letter of the law, but it was about the heart condition behind it. And over the next few weeks, we're going to flush that piece out just a little bit more as we look forward into the next verses in chapter 5 in which Jesus is going to lay out how he's fulfilling the law and how he's taking it to the next level. The third one is big. The third one is big. Our attitude towards the law. Our attitude towards the law. See, remember the law was an instruction tool. The law was to help train us, to help guide us, to help nurture us, to help protect us. It wasn't to take away our fun, which some people feel like it is. Some people feel like religion is that way. I can't go to church because all that is is just a big list of don't do this and don't do this and don't do this and you have to do this and I have to dress a certain way and I have to live a certain life and I have to, it's a big laundry list of, of rules and regulations. Well, that's religion. That ain't Christianity. Because Christianity is all about a relationship with God. It's a relationship of how to love God with everything that we are and how to love each other. But we get it confused sometimes, and we get confused with the law as well, because people think, well, the Mosaic law was just to curtail the fun. It was just to take away and say, put them under under your thumb, if you will. But it wasn't. It was was a tool to protect, protect, to nurture, and to grow. Think about it this way. As parents, as grandparents, we love our kids, and we put different rules, in fact, to help them, to protect them to help them grow, to help them learn. And see, God did that for the children of Israel. To help them learn who they are and grow into the nation in which he created them to be. And something that I found very interesting over the last several years in ministry is that a lot of people will say the Old Testament scriptures, they're irrelevant. They're they're boring. It's the old The old got replaced with the new, which there is some validity to that, but they're not boring. They're not irrelevant. They carry with it heaviness and weight. They carry with it an importance for our lives. Jesus knows this. That's that's why he's saying that he is the fulfillment of it. People will say, well, the God of the the New Testament, man, I can get behind that God because he's loving, he's gracious, He looks after his people. He provides opportunities for his people to grow. The Old Testament God, I can't really get behind him. I mean, he's wrathful. He's judgmental. There's so much hatred that seems to be pouring out against certain people throughout the scriptures. I just can't get behind a God like that. Well, let me tell you, the God of the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament is the exact same God. What we're seeing is different characteristics of God. We're seeing different pieces of his character being displayed for his children to see. We're seeing how loving and gracious and caring he is. But we have to take the time to understand it. We have to take the time to read through it. We have to take the time to see what he is communicating with us. But see, I, reason, I, think, that, I think that's the reason why a lot of people say the Old Testament is irrelevant. Because we don't take the time. We don't take the time to get into the mindset of understanding how God was involved in the lives of his children and teaching them very invaluable lessons. The next one is righteousness needs to exceed the law keepers. Righteousness needs to exceed the law keepers. See, true righteousness does not come from a laundry list. True righteousness does not come from putting out on an outward facade of trying to do our best. True righteousness doesn't come from us 
boosting our self-image and saying, well, I'm doing all these things and being able to list off everything that we've done or everything we've ever done in our life or different positions we've held or different jobs we have or different ways that we minister or different ways that we serve. None of that is true righteousness. True righteousness comes from what's inside. God doesn't care about the laundry list. He cares about the heart. The laundry list comes when we have God in our hearts, when we have a relationship with God, our lives are transformed and we become able to live out what we see in the Beatitudes that we studied a couple of weeks ago. And I'm going to read through those in just a moment here, for just a moment here. Blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those that say, I am not what's important God is. I can do nothing without God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, blessed who mourn over their sin, who realize that they are broken, they are sinful, they are nothing without God's love and grace, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice in that because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecute the prophets who were before you. See, true righteousness comes from having a heart that's been transformed by the Holy Spirit after putting your faith in Christ alone. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees of the day had traded true righteousness for self-righteousness. And we're in danger of doing that in our day and age. Thinking that we are all that matters. Adhering to an idea of religion rather than a relationship with God. And Jesus says that our righteousness must surpass theirs, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the religious elite, those that had everything from the exterior to be what was good and honorable to God. We have to surpass all of that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why do you do that? How do you do that? It's by having the right kind of heart, the right kind of attitude. To understand that just because we have obtained righteousness does not mean it's ours. It's God's living through us, given to us. Something we need to remember here is that when Jesus is speaking to the crowd up on this mountain, there's all kinds of people in the crowd. There are people that are attracted to him. There are people that follow him because they they like what he's saying. There are people that truly believe what he's saying. There are people that are kind of on the fence. And then there are people that are hoping to catch him in a mistake. There would have been the scribes and the Pharisees in the crowd. And Jesus is saying, everybody, your your righteousness has to surpass these people around you. Can you just imagine being a scribe or a Pharisee, being a religious leader of the time, and and the crowd is being told that they have to do better than you? Can you imagine being one of the other folks and looking at the religious elite and going, wait a minute, I'm supposed to surpass them? They're at church every Sunday. They're constantly on the mission field. They're constantly pouring out to people. They're constantly knocking on doors. They're constantly in outreach. They're constantly praying with people. They're constantly doing all these things. How can I? I don't have the time for that. My schedule won't allow that. Can you imagine what you would be feeling in that moment? What Christ is telling us is going, all that laundry list that they're doing, all those things that is an outside facade, all of those things that you're comparing yourself to means nothing if the heart is not right. The heart has to be right. You have to have that right relationship with God. Jesus is saying no matter how much you do, how much you try, how much you try to adhere to a written law, you will never be able to obtain the righteousness that is available through faith. Because us as humans, 
we are completely incapable of being 100% consistent. We just are. And this is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 3 when he says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. There are a lot of people in our culture today that have the mindset that their relationship with God is really all about the fact that God just wants them to do their best. That God just really wants them to try. As long as they're serving a little bit more than somebody else or attending worship more often, then they're good. That's not what it's about. God doesn't care about the laundry list. He cares about the heart. And not a single one of us can obtain righteousness on our own. We have to have God. We have to have God working inside of us. We have to have his power in our hearts. Let me give you an example of that. The Ten Commandments. Just for example, a couple of them. Honor thy father and thy mother. How many of you can say from the earliest memory to now that you've always, always honored and obeyed mom and dad? I don't think there's a single one of us in here that can say we have. Why? Because we're human. We fail. We make mistakes. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't covet. How many of you have ever looked and said, man, I wish I had that boat. I wish I had that camper. That's coveting. We cannot be 100%. But through Christ, we can. He's saying that the righteousness, true righteousness, doesn't come from a written law. It comes from having a true relationship with the one true God. Nothing in this world, nothing in this world matters more than that. There's nothing that we can do that would even come close to what God has already given us through the ultimate gift, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate action of love that we could ever have hoped for. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is showing us what the kingdom of God looks like. He's showing us the importance of the law, but the importance of why he came. And he says, not even the smallest of letters will pass away from the law. That's a reference back to the Greek and the Hebrew language in, in which the smallest of letters, the iota, which, or yoda, which some translations will say those words, it's meaning the smallest of the smallest of the smallest of details will not wipe away from the law. We still have certain things that we have to live by, that we have to strive for. They're called the Ten Commandments. Jesus fulfills the law, fulfills the sacrifice involved in the law, fulfills what the law's intent was, and brings forward a piece of it for us to still live through and live under, and that's the Ten Commandments. But over the next several weeks, we're going to dive into a little bit deeper to break this apart just a little bit more as we understand what do, what is Jesus mean when he says, talks about murder or talks about adultery or lust or honesty or going the second mile for somebody or do not judge. What does he mean when he says those things? All of those things are contained within the Mosaic law. But Jesus takes it to the step further. Let's pray.